Okay, if you could uh, take your seats, everyone. We're into the home stretch as far as sessions go. Thank you for your patience. I know it's been a, a long day in many ways, but a very interesting one with lots of great content and sharing. And um, what I'm seeing is a lot of one-on-one um, -on -one and small group conversations around the room throughout the day, and that's really important too, for those, that networking and those connections to be made um, that will um, have an impact uh, in their own ways um, in, the, in the communities where you, where you work and live. So, um, panel four, um, which is, that got the theme of connecting and revitalizing, uh, making media work for the community, is uh, moderated by Jenna Walsh. Jenna is the indigenous, indig this is a, I'm gonna, my tongue is gonna get garbled here, indigenous initiatives librarian at Simon Fraser University, and the liaison librarian for First Nation Studies, Archaeology, Environment, and resource environmental management. I hope I got that right. So, <laughs> so welcome Jenna and I will let you introduce the panelists. Hello everyone, thank you very much and um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, this taking place on um, unceded and traditional Musqueam territories and thank the Musqueam people for their hospitality. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce um, this wonderful panel, uh, beginning with Mary Dr. Marianne Ignace, who is the director of the First Nations Language Center at Simon Fraser University, and is professor in the departments of linguistics and First Nation studies. She currently directs a seven year SHIRK partnership grant on First Nations language revitalization in BC and the Yukon, uh, working with 12 diverse language groups. Her own research is focused on Sequapem, yes? Sequapmuch, thank you. Um, Smalgyach and Heidel language documentation. Is that close? Okay, <laughs> I tried. Um, uh, and she continues to work with elders and language learners in her home community, Skichestin. It's close to, okay. Um, I, my apologies for mispronunciation. Um, in her adopted community, Old Masset in Haida Gwaii, and with Smalyak speakers um, and learners in Prince Rupert. Her other interests are ethnobotany and indigenous language story work. So please welcome Marianne. Thank you. Do we know how to make it up on the. Oh. Hello, Wade. Uh, like Jenna, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Mus Muspian people on whose homeland we are for hosting us. Um, as uh, Jenna mentioned, I'm uh, the director of a seven-year SHIRK partnership grant uh, where we work in collaboration with uh, about a dozen different First Nations language groups and some represented by some 22 or 23 organizations in BC and the Yukon, and uh, an equal number of academic uh, collaborators and co-investigators. And uh, what we set out to do uh, through this grant, which we started out with in 2013, was to uh, document First Nations languages by way of recording as much information as we can while we still have elders to do it with. As you all know, our languages are in critically endangered states and uh, as quite literally we're in, the, uh, sort of, uh, in, in this grant program, uh, we're losing elders and speakers of our languages uh, year by year. 
so in, in addition to the documentation, we also set out to provide support systems uh, for language learning and the future of languages through second language learners. One, uh, and one of them obviously involves uh, creating safe digital storage and backup me mechanisms for organizations that would like to uh, engage in that, uh, but also to build cool apps for First Nations language learners. And the part of the project that I will show you about in the presentation here uh, involves my own home community, Skichisten, in the Sahuapmuk Nation in the South Central Interior in British Columbia. And you can see the green there, that's where we are. And uh, Skichisten is about halfway between uh, Kamloops and Cache Creek. Um, when languages decline, uh, with uh, fewer and fewer first, la first language speakers. Uh, one of the things that's lost are the, the ability to speak, but also the many registers of speech, how to make conversation, how to start up a conversation, how to end a conversation, how people interact in conversation, the vocabulary or lexicon, and also grammatical structures that are especially the more complex, complicated kind of structures. And other things like how in telling a story, for example, uh, the speaker of a language tracks the topic throughout the narrative and switches a uh, topic of foregrounds, events, and people or, or not, and so forth. The use of metaphor and pun and uh, alliteration. So in other words, the poetic use of language. And those are, of course, the things that as we have younger speakers who were not raised as much in the language, those are the kind of things that especially become endangered. And uh, stories are an important thing in that uh, as a pedagogical tool for learners, as a way to connect cultural and linguistic content, um, and uh, also to explore linguistic forms, the, uh, what I was just talking about, that are being forgotten. Uh, and especially in stories uh, where you have uh, the uh, ways in which literary language, oral literary language is produced, that uh, very complex uh, kind of forms uh, are the ones that uh, st uh, storytellers choose. So what, what I want to uh, talk about here uh, in my presentation are two stories about stories. And uh, it actually starts out with uh, what if you don't have stories in the language? And so there's nothing to digitize to start with, uh, but you can eventually arrive at content that can be digitized and in our case that you can actually turn into uh, story apps. So this is my group of uh, fluent speakers and elders in Skichisten. We're fortunate that we have uh, about uh, seven, eight elders who were raised with the language. They're in their 70s to mid-late 80s. Uh, a couple of the uh, people here that are in this pictures have uh, passed away actually in the last uh, year and a half. And Sokwa uh, Mokchin has two genres of story. Those are the ancient oral histories or oral traditions, sometimes mistakenly translated as myths, but we don't treat them as myths. They're actually reference events uh, in history a long time ago that uh, also reference uh, the uh, events in uh, the ecology, the climate, and uh, the uh, social intercourse among Sukhwatmuk and other people. And we have slacha'im that are kind of like uh, handed down personal accounts. Um, and uh, in, in terms of the record that exists, the past recordings that were made during the Boesian age and earlier or after uh, include George M. Dawson, the, uh, who headed up the Geological Survey of Canada and who was a bit of a hobby ethnographer and took down some stories uh, in, that he wrote down in English that uh, his uh, Sahuatmoch guides uh, told him, Bo Franz Boas, who spent a very brief amount of time in Sahuatmoch territory in the Kamloops area and recorded his story through the medium of Chinook jargon. Uh, unlike his uh, 
tremendous body of Kwakwala texts and uh, Tsimshian texts and so forth that he uh, uh, recorded or local uh, indigenous people recorded them with and for him, uh, Boaz uh, recorded his stories or wrote them down in English. And finally, we had James Tate, the uh, ethnographer, who recorded from Sukhwatmuk elders and storytellers in 1900 quite a body of well over 100 oral traditions, uh, unfortunately not in the language, but uh, he wrote them down in his own English prose. But uh, I was quite fortunate in the mid 80s to mid 90s, I was able to work with Ida William, who was the granddaughter of one of Tate's storytellers, uh, who could then actually tell the stories that Tate had written down 80 years earlier in Sukhwamakchin. And uh, so this is what the uh, Tate stories look like in the 1909 uh, publication, The Shushwap. Uh, they're entirely in English and also not in English as it would have been translated at the time from Sukhwamakchin by the storytellers, but this is Tate's own prose. Uh, but they're fairly detailed. And we have various other kind of recordings. Some of uh, Art Kuypers was a Dutch linguist who worked with uh, Sukhwapmoch uh, speakers in various communities in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, Randy Bouchard and Dorothy Kennedy, uh, who, pu uh, who did not publish uh, stories they collected in Sukhwapmoch Chin either, but in their own English translation or rendition. Uh, myself and my husband, Chief Ron Ignace, have uh, been recording storytellers for the, uh, for the last 30 years or so. And some of these collections are accessible. They exist in tape recorded form, have been digitized, but some of them are also less accessible. And uh, it also, a, a case in point is uh, how difficult it is to uh, preserve, preserve collections over a long period of time if uh, First Nations organizations don't have the funds to have steady and uh, reliable curation of collections. So s some of the uh, collections, in fact, over the years uh, are not intact anymore. And so this is then where work with the elders comes in. So we started in 2009 and uh, in particular, in the last uh, three and a half to four years, uh, we set out on this project of reclaiming the recordings that were made by Tate, which we only have in print form, and by retelling and rewriting them. And uh, so why story writing? Um, the elders in our community all went to residential school, the Kamloops Indian Residential School. None of them were trained as storytellers. So they themselves had, themselves had to get a comfort level with actually uh, using stories, telling stories. And uh, so they found much more of a comfort level with together collaboratively writing them. And uh, some of this with a plain whiteboard and some of this uh, with a PowerPoint projector where they arrive at sentence by sentence or paragraph by paragraph at uh, this is the best possible way we think this should be said. And uh, so that shows a little bit of the work of the group. And uh, this here shows then what stories look like. This is the same one, the owl and chipmunk story that uh, I showed you in the uh, version from uh, the print version from Tate. And this was a very interesting one because uh, the uh, story contains a pun and recovering that pun took a little bit of hard work. Uh, as you can see, it has two parallel lines there. And we uh, kind of uh, played around with lexical suffixes and roots and so forth. And eventually we, we kind of, we, we got it. So uh, that's just one example. But if you don't have the good fluent speakers anymore, this is work that you can't do anymore. And so that's really kind of the last kick at the can to try to recon reconstruct and reclaim some of these. Uh, last year, or a year and a half ago, we set out on a quite an ambitious project to uh, rewrite, retell, reclaim an epic Transformer story, Tlitsa and his brothers, which uh, 
exists in a variety in three different versions, uh, partially from Tate, from George M. Dawson, and from uh, Boaz himself. And uh, in the end, it's a script of some uh, 25 or so pages of interlinear story, uh, which references a number of places in the Sahuapo. And it, it really kind of runs like a red thread from Shushwap Lake through Kamloops, then with a foray into the North Thompson and eventually uh, Cache Creek and over to the Fraser River and uh, so forth. And uh, the places are still visible in the landscape where this takes place. And so some of the results then is regaining uh, place names. Uh, regaining some sense of what are fairly complex form in the language of ev how people use evidentials, uh, how people in a running narrative uh, use complex conjoined and subordinated sentences, and the real use of tense and aspect marking, which is a little bit different than uh, how it's reported in the uh, existing uh, grammar materials. And of course also uh, looking archaeologically at what are the kind of implements that uh, stories uh, deploy and that or storytellers uh, talk about? And then we had the stories illustrated by an artist who became the hands of the storytellers. Uh, and uh, he would, based on what we had produced uh, in, uh, in the narration and in print, uh, he would produce a sketch and then the elders would uh, critique it and uh, figure the, the bunny on the left side here, for example, it's, it's, a, it's a very mean rabbit. And so the, 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 the rabbit did not look like the way it should. So it got redrawn. And sometimes it's the way a person holds a hand when they're uh, in, in, in a prayer or it's uh, authentic looking snowshoes and moccasins and all those kind of things that uh, they were able then to guide the uh, illustrator through. Uh, so this is what just some of these episodes look like then with the uh, finished drawings. And uh, they, as I said, they reference places and they reference uh, ethnobiological information and uh, of course uh, social and political protocols and so forth. And uh, so uh, that's just a selection of those and actually then together and with some of the youth in our community revisiting the places uh, was uh, what we did in the end. So that was uh, the regaining stories that we now have re-recorded and then can do something with. Uh, the second story about story I want to just uh, talk about uh, is one that actually did exist in a narration. Uh, it's a story that was uh, recorded by Art Kuypers, uh, the linguist, uh, in the late 1960s. And uh, Kuypers called it the Trout Children and their Grandmother. It has no reference as to what place it describes and what, uh, what it's really about. It's a long story that took the storyteller about 40 minutes to tell in Sukhwat Mokchim, uh, with many different episodes that reference the earth world, the sky world, the world under the water, and uh, the relationships between grandparents and their children and grandchildren and so on and so forth, and between guests and hosts. Um, and uh, it was told uh, by the late Charlie Draney. Uh, and it turns actually out that George M. Dawson had heard this from a storyteller, but uh, because he took interest in place, uh, he noted down which particular place it's about. And it's a, a, a lake called Pipsis, also called Jacko Lake uh, in English. And uh, Tate himself recorded yet another version of it. And we could not find a recording that actually was the uh, cassette tape or the digitized version. There was one that still existed in the Sukhwatmok archives, which was probably from a third or fourth generation tape recording. So it was basically inaudible. And uh, as it turned out then, um, this uh, particular story that, I'm just going to go back here, references this lake here, 
uh, is right now at the sort of very much in the public limelight in the Kamloops area um, because uh, there is a planned development project to uh, open a pit mine right on the outside of it. Uh, you can see the little lake, how it's eventually, uh, if this happens, uh, borders on a 500 meter deep and two kilometer long pit. And it was actually in the process of uh, the uh, hearings uh, uh, for the, uh, with the Environmental Assessment Agency uh, that the Trout Children's story kind of became publicly known. And it turned up a tape recording. Uh, which we thought we could never get back. Uh, and it's an, actually a, a very audible tape recording, which is a slightly different version than by the same storyteller than the one that uh, uh, Kuypers had uh, transcribed. And uh, so again, we put the illustrator to work, and these are just a few of them, to uh, illustrate it. Uh, and. Um, Then uh, we're in the process of turning these two and several other stories into story apps through our project. And so they will feature read-along narration and word glossaries, cultural commentary about plot, meaning, social, botanical, and zoological features, but, uh, linguistic commentary about stylistic feature and grammar, and interactive place names, map, and photos. Of course, the illustrations with some animations. And they will feature learner activities for practicing storytelling so that our young learners, or not so young learners of the language, can uh, use the uh, story app to uh, then practice telling the story themselves in episodes, chunked down into small pieces, and quizzing themselves about what they're able to do. So that's one or two examples of turning uh, materials that either are digitally available or that you have to first get back into community resources. Guckstedtjörp, thank you. Just stand over here. Um, whoops. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Marianne. Um, our next speaker is Aaron Leon, who grew up in the North Okanagan and is a member of the Splatchine Band. Aaron has worked in the Language and Culture Program in at the Splatchine Sumsatalton Teaching Center for seven years. Graduate. Uh, my apologies again. We did go over this uh, in the in the lunch lineup, but. Um, um, he graduated from Concordia University with a BFA in 2013 and has since returned to work in Splatchine. Jim Sullivan. Thank you. Um, Aaron helps the Kihia'a with the Language and Culture Program, helping teach the Tsutsumamalt. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, the Splatchine language. So, welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Hello, White. Um, for this presentation, I guess I'm just going to talk a bit about myself, my work that I do at the Splatching Chimic Sultan, and a little bit, a little bit about uh, digitization. And uh, that's really close. <laughs> so, White for White Up. My name is Aaron Leon, Esquest Trill Uyken. Uh, that's a name I got in 2004, which translates to something like. Uh, like an arrow straight aim on target. Um, Splatchine is a community located in the North Okanagan. Around the town of Inderby, we have about 7,000 members total and about three to 400 living on reserve. Um, I started working at the Splatchine Chimic Sultan, I guess, quite a while ago, just under my grandma, Rosalind Williams, and helping her transition into the digital era. Uh, the Splatchine Chimic Sultan is a teaching center that started as a daycare, but as we put more emphasis on the language and culture, it turned into the Chimic Sultan Teaching Center. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization 
sorry. So we come across a lot of those um, funding grant to grant type stuff. Um, one of my initial roles was to digitize the resources collected by my grandma and find out digital storage solutions to that. Um, yeah, so digitizing and managing the physical archive, making a filing system, which makes sense. Um, I guess picking up from all the different grantees who've uh, pieced together what they thought was a good filing system and putting that all in order, which takes quite a while to figure out everybody's different mindsets. <laughs> and then I guess uh, digital, uh, trans yeah, transferring into some kind of a digital database or filing system that makes sense and that you can kind of, uh, I guess, just make sure that other people can pick up on what you're thinking and continue that kind of work. So, and then I, through the indigitization grant, it kind of, I was kind of looking for answers to how I can do this kind of thing and uh, came across the indigitization grant and it was kind of pretty happenstance and awesome that they explained a lot of these kind of things. Um, in the first round of indigitization, I applied to digitize the collection of the audio cassettes. Uh, this collection was part of my grandma's documentation of the Splatching history that she started recording in 1991, but we have tapes that go back till 1975 or so, and a few hundreds of tapes. So it was quite a bit of work, but we're thankful for the funding to make that work possible. Um, this collection is mostly based around discussions with the elders on the, like, everything from the local geography, the Stupchakula, the stories, uh, different historical information, uh, language lessons, and interviews. I guess trying to remember some of the words and things that make our Splatchian dialect pretty unique. And a lot of interviews with our late, one of our late last um, local historians, Grandpa Francis. So these are very precious recordings and we're very grateful to have the ability to, I guess, digitize them and make them more accessible. Um, these recordings are, yeah, like, like I said, they're precious. They will be a resource, a resource to the collective members of Splatchine when our fluent speakers are gone because uh, it's a bit scary. <laughs> um, the content recorded thanks to the indigitization program and the structure of the program. Uh, we now have metadata and stuff, so it is searchable, but we're really looking for a transcription and to further process these, and I guess for funding and how to use, so if anybody has some advice on good transcription details, I'd be into that. <laughs> and um, yeah, then digitization really helped us give ideas, really helped us set up and give ideas to how a digital archive can look and some ways of making that practical. We have set up a digital long-term solution based on a RAID setup and have off-site and on-site backups, which is pretty nice. We're pretty fortunate for that too. Um, yeah, another thing that was pretty neat and as we become, I guess, involved with a lot more projects and we kind of grow as a teaching center and branching out, we're discovering the importance of access protocols and who can access this information. Um, if we are to use a CMS like uh, Mercutu. Okay. Um, and so far, uh, it seems like a lot of it takes a lot of work and we have a small team of two, three people now. So to dive into something and just put in a whole lot of work into metadata, we haven't been ready for that jump yet. So, so far, um, we just have people coming in and asking for it. Because um, as a reminder earlier with Larry Grant, Elder Larry Grant reminded us that um, digitization does not have the human element. We still need our, el our elders and knowledge keepers to give us cultural context around the files in our digital archive. Um, we have shared a bit online through YouTube and language videos and cultural events. Um, that kind of stuff was made with the mindset that it would be publicly available, so that's a little bit different than the archives and collections that were in interviews. And trying to figure all that kind of stuff out has been quite the process. Um, so I guess digital context. I'll try to 
see what is important for the last five minutes here. <laughs> All right. So the some of the digital files that we've been able to obtain from the cassettes have been used um, in curriculum in teaching the at uh, the Splatchin to McSaldon, where we have a big emphasis on getting the Kiki of the elders to teach the mammal the children. Uh, we do this mostly through song and different seasonal curriculum. Um, a lot of those lessons have been recorded in the cassettes, so now we can use them again, which is nice. Uh, some of the cassettes contain historical knowledge and advanced lessons that are being transformed into uh, lessons to put into the app that Marianne had mentioned through SFU. And um, this app is pretty neat because to me, uh, you can create curriculum and put it in a place and help train teachers to train the community and give out resources to the community and then help, I guess, track progress through that learning. Um, yeah, and plus everybody has cell phones and apps are really neat. <laughs> Another project that we're doing is in partnership with uh, UBCO master student David Laco, and this is kind of a uh, app video game hybrid that was inspired by the way the game Never Alone approached the video game realm with uh, storytelling to share the Nupiak stories in the Alaskan native culture. Um, yeah, this app is also informed by our involvement in community theater and storytelling and Stiptacula. So we were kind of looking towards this to help involve the youth into, I guess, look towards. Well, they play video games, right? So to see themselves within a video game is pretty, it's pretty big. So we're looking to maybe re recreate something like that. Um, so yes, these are some of the projects that will be informed by the tapes digitized by the indigitization program and I guess the long-term structures that they helped to build, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> Because, yeah, these are important. They're the only thing we'll have once our fluent speakers pass on. So, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And I'd like to take a second to just acknowledge everyone in this room for all the great work that they're doing. Like, it's been a big learning experience for us, and I'd like to thank you for all the work you're doing. So, Cook Stelp. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Marvin Williams. He is Indigenous Planning Facilitator at Lake Baby, Bay Bay uh, Nation Treaty Office. He does interviews of their members, analyzes and digitizes old recordings of past elders. He also transcribes recordings and researches from archives. Please welcome Marvin Williams. So of Jaja and then of Dilly can play a bayet, the tabitis type. Muskegum, um, Messiah, but a destiny chain of Yen got yet a stick. Muskegon First Nation, Larry Grant, Tabby Messiah, but the sneedy and Yen got yet a stick. Sarah Dupont. Masai near the snee and Annie Steeny. A dear connect by yet the Jerry Larson. Kay connect is the lean in one of all this light. A guy Jane by yes, Deltic. I just um, started by thanking the Muskegon First Nation, Elder Larry Grant, on being um, for being on his traditional territory. And I thank uh, Sarah Dupont for, in, for inviting me to, to speak on the indigitization. And I, I express the importance of uh, digitizing um, uh, this, the uh, tapes that are old and uh, 
that are going to be ruined. And um, it's, uh, I think it's important uh, that we do that. And um, Jerry Lawson, I also thank you for the course uh, that you have um, done. And it's uh, really important. And uh, Jerry is a real good teacher. Um, he's um, real good with um, the people. And I enjoyed his course. I was here um, a couple of years ago, I believe. Um, and <clears throat> getting into the digitization itself, I think um, I've, I've heard um, many people talking about language. I think the language is very important. Keeping your language is, is, is crucial because um, you never know when your language is going to disappear. And as the elders pass and as the, um, the, um, the majority become, the, the, the youth that are now, that don't speak the, the language, become um, elders themselves. Uh, we're afraid that we would um, be losing our language also. And through uh, digitization, we can um, keep the, the, the language. And right now we have um, a curriculum in our uh, nation that, that's teaching the young children from grade one to grade seven, teaching them um, how to speak our language. And that's the, la the carrier language, Athabascan language that I just started off with. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> the elders that, are, that have passed on, I've, do I've been doing interviews for the last seven years with um, elders um, I've worked with a lot of elders, and um, a lot of those elders that, that I've worked with all passed on. And this is the hard part of the job, is when elders pass on, you, you feel it inside yourself. Because you, did, you worked so hard with these elders, and you create a bond with all the elders that you work with. And um, it's really hard to... Um, to hear of an elder that passed. Um, <clears throat> because last, um, last month I lost my, uh, my aunt. She was one of the important members that we always brought back in. And two weeks ago I lost my, my godfather. And he was 93 years old. The information that he had was amazing. And again, we were, luck we're lucky to have the tapes and um, the video and audio tapes that we've recorded of him. I was talking to Sarah about, about um, the importance of digitization. Uh, when you work with old tapes, um, you can't just keep rewinding. You can't keep going back when you're doing digitization because you're um, these old tapes are brittle, and the importance of digitizing these tapes is when you when it is digitized, you can keep going back and forth. I heard somebody talking about um, the fluence, the high um, carrier or high fluency of the Aboriginal language, and we we run into that also um, when we talk about. Um, what the elders tell us. As you can see on a slide, um, Lake Babi Nation Treaty and our stories that our elders tell. And these are the stories that um, we go by and they're the stories that we're gonna teach our children. And one day I'm gonna be gone and um, once I'm gone and anybody that's working with the treaty office is gone, uh, these tapes will remain. And in the future, they can, our uh, future children can get into them, and they got at least we'll leave something behind. The traditional youth studies is uh, really important when it comes to First Nations. First of all, uh, I would like to say that in our traditional territory, there's. Um, not only uh, First Nations, they're not only LBN members, there are um, <clears throat> private owners, as we call them, um, um, non-Aboriginals that live on there, and we consider them as members of the First Nations because we all live together. 
when, um, when I say that, I, I truly mean that. And a lot of our um, counselors, or a lot of our chief and council and our leaders all have the same, the same thing that I'm talking about. Uh, interviewing the elders is really important, as I stated, writing down the information given by the elders, creating maps, collect, fo collecting photos of these elders that they have given. Our hunting areas, um, fishing, fishing sites, uh, berry picking, and the sites collect, collected uh, Indian medicine. Now, there was a story about an elder that brought us into the, into the bush, and we, we collected um, Devil's Club, and he told us a story of why, um, we, um, why he took us out that certain time, because the Devil's Club uh, is um, picked beside a river, beside a creek or a river. And that time when we were there, the creek was really high. The river was pretty high, and he said that the, the Devil's Club uh, has more power when you collect it when the creek is pretty high. So what you do with the Devil's Club is you, you, you peel off the needles, and then you peel, you peel the inside, the green part, and then you boil it. And you, you, you mix it with um, spruce and um, juniper leaves and then that gives you medicine. And that's how the medicine is made. And that, that part of the, <clears throat> was uh, that part I learned from um, old um, cassette tapes. And um, I didn't review the cassette tape. I viewed the digitized product that was made from the cassette. And knowing our history and keeping our culture strong is also important. Here you see uh, Chief Michelle and um, the bellman. Uh, it, this was around August when the, um, the sockeye starts running. And this is um, them drying um, salmon, sockeye salmon outside. Is what you do is you dry the sockeye salmon outside, then you bring it in, you cut it up, and then you bring it inside to smoke it. And uh, um, that's part of our culture, and that's the culture that's keeping strong, because now uh, <clears throat> we have um, elders um, teaching the young people how to cut fish, how to smoke the salmon uh, properly, how to um, make sure you preserve um, everything that um, comes out of the water. And the villages that, um, that we have, the, there's about five villages on um, our traditional territory, and collecting these information on these villages are important. All the areas where our members lived had their houses and their smoke houses, fishing camps and cabins. And here we have the barricade, the barricades um, before they were put, um, brought down in 1906. This is an Lake. And it's between the Babin Lake and the Babin River. And this is a story that, um, as you know, 1906 was a long time ago. And these stories were told in the 30s um, by um, cassette tapes and um, real old tapes. And these were um, tapes that were uh, digitized. Um, maybe, in, I, maybe I'm wrong, it's probably the 50s or 60s. But stuff like that, um, information that we um, were lucky to have because of digitization, and digitization is the only way that we can um, keep viewing these tapes. Here we have uh, Father Kokla and Big George. Big George was a chief of Old Fort, and um, Chief Jack Williams was a chief of um, Fort Babine. But uh, Jack Williams was the chief of the whole Babine territory. And this is a, a shot of um, the three of them in Ottawa in 1906, when um, Jack Williams and uh, Big George uh, were accompanied by Father Kokla to go to Ottawa and fight for our fishing rights, because the barricades were taken down from the, uh, the previous photo that you have seen. And um, in 1905, um, Helkinson uh, Fisheries, um, named Helkinson, went into Babine Lake. 
And um, he started taking down the, uh, the fish weirs because he believed that the Babian people were taking too much fish. But he, um, he kind of um, went in there and he immediately assumed that the Babian people were taking too much fish. Uh, but he didn't, um, he didn't ask questions. He just came in and did his business and went back. Uh, he wrote a letter to J.T. Williams who was, um, who was a head man for fisheries and he told him that the Babian people were taking too much fish because he seen these uh, fish weirs that they were all full of fish. But one thing he didn't know is some of the fish, some of the species that haven't spawned yet were being released once they were taken out of the weirs. And the ones that they, they kept was the sockeye because the sockeye already did their spawning before they reached the, the Nilakitko Lake because the sockeye spawn in the, in the rivers. And these are some of the things that um, we, if it wasn't for digitizing, we wouldn't have been able to, to um, thank you again, Sarah and Jerry, for that. Here's uh, Chief Michel. Uh, chief Michel was a chief back then uh, when he got sick, and so Big George was, um, was uh, the man that was elected to accompany Jack Williams to Ottawa. Here we have Chief Michel and a helper building a dugout canoe. And these um, dugout canoes were used before um, we uh, had uh, river boats, before we learned how to do the, uh, the river boats. And um, that's just some of the stuff, some of the stories we were able to collect. And here is a hereditary chief doing um, grass dancing. Um, there was another story about, um, and this is my uncle, my late uncle, Michelle Dennis. They used to have sports days um, in the past, and um, it wasn't um, hockey or baseball or anything like that. It was games um, to see who was the best hunter, to see who can run in a bush the, far, the fastest and the, the endurance that they had. And here we have... Um, hereditary chief dancing on the grass and he was getting timed on how long he, he danced and that was the competition of who was the strongest, who was the fastest. And there was other um, games that they, they played that had to do with hunting, had to do with fishing, and had to do with strength. And th those are the stories that we, we collect. Uh, <clears throat> Getting back to the fish and the fish weir, here's an elder that talks about fishing in the 1800s and the early 1900s. He was in his 90s here. And he spoke of um, the, uh, um, the fence that's in Babine Lake right now, of the way the, the, um, the fishing was years ago. He spoke of how we um, contained the fish better, how the fish was able to um, multiply better, and he said that we took care of the fish better better than the, the fisheries did. Because um, the fence has um, li limited openings, so um, there's um, a fish species, um, the spring salmon, they stopped going to Babine Lake. And before the fence was built, there, there used to be salmon, spring salmon on Babbing Lake, according to this um, Donald Tom. And Donald Tom was blind. And one of the stories that um, I, I um, seen on um, when, when, he, when they were younger, the elder that told the story was a little girl. And Donald was sitting by the lake, looking at the lake. And um, this elder was a little girl and she snuck up to Donald and sat down. And Donald turned around, Rita, is that you? And Rita was amazed how Donald knew it was her. It could have been anybody that stood beside her. And he kept on ask, or calling her and um, three times he asked her, is that you? Then he finally said, he confirmed, no, that's you, Rita. You can talk now. So Rita spoke, and he said, how did you know it was me? 
Oh, I know what the sounds that you make. And that's the elder, how uh, amazing it is. And um, I remember uh, Donald's later years, when he was older, on our, um, on our reserve in, um, in Babin Lake, or in Burns Lake, um, he used to leave a house and he didn't have any guidance. He would go out and visit friends and he would knock on a door and he would say hello to the person that was living at that place and he knew exactly where he was. And that's how amazing this man was. And here we, uh, I like to uh, talk about the Aboriginal people that are hardworking people, as you all know. Because back in the day, we had to be hardworking people. A lot of the older stories that, uh, that I heard, I've heard was um, you can't just go to the supermarket and you can't buy uh, um, meat or groceries. You had to go in the bush. You had to work for your next meal. And uh, the variety that they talked about in the bush was amazing. They, um, the stories that, that the men would go out and they wouldn't see their families for months at a time, uh, always out doing something, bear hunting, and there's always a time for bear hunting, moose hunting, the same thing, uh, trapping. Um, trapping was implemented um, to the Lake Babby Nation in 1924, but prior to the, um, the trapping, we used to make our own, um, we used to make our own um, um, traps. They used um, uh, poplar trees. They would cut a square on a poplar tree, like, and then they would start pulling. They would rip, they would walk back and they would pull as far as they can. And um, when the poplar, when it breaks, and it all goes down, and you have a long, long rectangular, um, rectangular uh, rope kind of thing, and uh, they would cut little pieces. It was about that long, that wide, and they would turn it. They would keep wet, making it wet, and they would turn it, and then that's how they made their rope. And in our language, that's called galtai, and galtai was used uh, um, to um, to catch moose. Um, it was strong enough to hold a moose, and um, they would have their spears um, that was made out of um, obsidian. The, the head was made out of obsidian, and that's the obsidian that they got from trades. Uh, <clears throat> some of this uh, we heard from stories, and some of this we heard from the archaeological dig that we did in, um, at the um, defense area and an archaeological dig that was done at the, um, the Smokehouse Island. And one thing about the Smokehouse Island, it was man-made. It was engineered by man. In the 17 and 1800s, the archaeologists found out that they kept on throwing rocks into the water, our people. And then eventually the, mount, or the, um, the island was made. And the purpose for that was when, when the island was made, they can put um, weirs on both sides of the islands so they can um, put, um, put uh, those traps, those barricades in there, those fish traps. And um, getting back to this photo, this is an 86-year-old woman at the time carrying two by 12s. And she was helping her son build a, build a home. And that, um, gives you an idea of how our people, how strong our people were back then. And um, we're trying to teach our children that uh, so they can get back to that. And <clears throat> this is a, a couple of smoke houses, uh, fish camps out in Babine Lake, and this is a real old photo. Uh, we found this photo at the BC archives um, that said, um, um, Smoke houses, a couple of smoke houses, or a smoke camp, or a fishing camp on Babbing Lake. Uh, <clears throat> those are some of the photos that we have, and then <clears throat> our culture uh, is really strong. We still have the potlatch right now, and these are uh, um, some hereditary chiefs uh, wearing their regalias. 
the one that um, that wearing that brown the brown fur and that's beaver pelts made out of beaver pelts, because um, that guy uh, that is wearing that is my the, my godfather. That uh, that died recently, and he was 93 years old. Uh, that's just some of the stuff that. Um, we go back to because some sometimes where our seating plan when we get into when we get into the seating plan uh, I'll just go through quickly. Uh, here's a fishing or today's fishing. As you can see, the amount of fish that we get when we um, have the salmon. This is when the salmon comes in, and this is the um, the babbing fence. Um, and Masaicho, thank you very much. That's all I got. And uh, that's um, some stories that um, I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you this if it wasn't for indigitization. Because, um, like I said, the old tapes, are, it's impossible to transcribe anything or get anything from the old tapes if they're t um, the tapes. But indigitization makes it possible for me to sit here and tell you about our people. Masaicho, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marvin. Um, our, uh, the final speaker on this panel is Ramona Rose, who is head of the, of the Northern BC Archives and Special Collections at the University of Northern British Columbia. Ramona manages the Archival and Heritage Collection at the University and has worked in the educational and cultural heritage management field for over 25 years, both in the university sector and in the public archives and museums. As well, she has served on archival, museum, and heritage uh, community boards, including, including the Archives Association of BC and Barkerville Heritage Trust. Her professional interests include community archiving, active history, and per active history participation, and material culture analysis. Welcome, Ramona. Thank you. OK, thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge that uh, we're on the land of the Musqueam people and want to thank them for inviting us all to uh, their territory for this forum. And thank you also especially to Sarah and Jerry for asking me to speak about the work that we do with communities in our region. Um, my talk is a little bit different in the sense that I'm talking about what happens before digitization. Uh, and so I want to thank Marvin for really crystallizing what the work that we've done and how it's moved into the phase that they're working on. So we're really happy about that. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about some of the storage agreements that we've put into place with First Nations communities uh, in northern BC and how those agreements have led to subsequent projects uh, with communities. And finally, a few thoughts about the next steps in terms of what communities are thinking about in terms of integrating digital collections into uh, programs. Clock up here. Okay. Just that. Just Okay. Thanks. Okay. So to provide some geographic and institutional context to the archives' work with communities, um, the university is really rooted in the community um, from its grassroots beginnings of when it um, uh, started back at uh, late 1980s. Uh, when people from all of the north lobbied for a university to exist in northern BC. And that close connection is really um, shown and has been extended throughout its development and continues really today into its uh, vision and programs. UMBC's vision, as it continues to say, is in the north and for the north and be responsive to the regions that it serves. Uh, its motto uh, from the Dakli uh, carrier language, and Cha Huna, uh, translates as respecting all forms of life and to recognize different perspectives of our different diverse communities. 
And that vision is really carried out in the physical presence through our regional campuses that it serves in central and northern British Columbia, uh, from Cornell uh, and, and up to Prince George, where uh, I'm uh, existing, and in uh, Fort St. John at the Peace River Yard, and then to the coast at the Terrace Campus. So to meet the needs of First Nations communities, mechanisms have been put into place to ensure the appropriate protocols are followed, and those are uh, created via the University Senate and the Senate Committee on First Nations and Aboriginal Peoples reviews and recommends guidelines for protocols and affiliation agreements. Membership on the Senate Committees includes representative First Nations and Aboriginal Peoples from Northern British Columbia. The Archives also operates within the protocols of Senate and, for example, the work that we've done, uh, particularly with Marvin and Lake Babine, is framed within the protocol agreement uh, with UNBC. Also, the Archives works within the spirit of other established archival agreements, including protocols for Native American archival materials. So with that in regard, we strive to maintain best practices and consult with communities uh, to be aware of culturally sensitive materials and to rethink access issues, uh, look at reciprocal education, and also particularly for, for us is to raise awareness of these issues within the archival profession itself. So to provide a little bit of background on how these storage agreements came about, uh, about um, UMBC first became involved in creating a, a, an agreement with the uh, First Nations community in 1997 when the Karras County Tribal Council, on behalf of its members, undertook a project to computerize genealogy records that had been compiled by the Prince George Catholic Diocese. The original genealogy research was conducted by an oblate uh, missionary priest who served in Karras County uh, tr communities across northern BC. And using baptismal marriage and death certificates that were created by the diocese, it's one of the first written records of Aboriginal residency patterns in the area. The genealogy is contained in 240 books outlining the descendancy of approximately 19,000 First Nations peoples of North, and the records date from about mid-19th century to early 1950s. So the agreement between CSTC and the university provides for preventative care of the printed genealogy records and also sets up a process to facilitate research requests to the records. The archivists provide, myself and another archivist, provide access to the genealogies once permission has been approved by the CSTC. The records have been utilized in a variety of research projects from family histories, language research, and treaty research. Since then, the archives has worked with several communities to create uh, storage agreements, and we have five to date. And the template shown here has formed the basis of those agreements with communities. Essentially, they are in trust holding agreements uh, that allow the community to manage access to their own records and determine what level of access is permitted. For most of the communities that the archives has in place with community access is limited uh, to community members only. Uh, the records are kept at the archives for storage and safekeeping, and the archives facilitates access to researchers that have been approved by the community. Uh, also, the community designates an individual who is responsible for authorizing such access. Uh, there also uh, allows for a period of review, um, at which time the community can determine if it wants to bring the records back to their community. So in relation to the work that we've done, particularly with Lake Babine, um, that started back in 2009 when we were approached by their then treaty coordinator, Joe Michelle, to assess what materials could be transferred to the archives as part of a storage agreement. Um, so I went out to Burns Lake to review what holdings were there, and we decided uh, when we all got together that it was really the audio and video recordings uh, that should be the focus of preventative storage. As well, it was realized that creating an inventory and determining content of the recordings was needed in order to determine digitization strategy. So we considered how we could do this together, and neither of us had uh, much resources in the way of staff or funding to do that. Um, so through the First Nations Studies Department, we were able to create a graduate level accredited internship uh, for a First Nations student who happened to be from Lake Babine, and the records were transferred to the archives, and I supervised the internship and oversaw the creation of an archival inventory of the holdings uh, that was created by Corbin. He identified the research significance of select materials and recommended which items to prioritize for digitization. 
We uh, provided the advice on best practices for storage and assisted with finding a digitization vendor and liaised with the vendor to uh, provide them access to the, to the materials. Since then, another Lake Pabian student has collected, uh, has continued the inventory work and to date we've got about 1,200 recordings that have been inventoried and much of the collection has been digitized. Uh, another agreement was signed with Tackler Lake uh, First Nation, a community about 400 kilometers north of Prince George, to store its audio uh, video material as well. Uh, and these images show the ceremony at which the uh, agreement was signed. And it was a great day of celebration with traditional dancing and drumming and song. Uh, at the same event, another storage agreement was signed with the William George family of Takla and to provide storage for over 50 recordings created by their father in the 1980s. So building on the momentum of the agreement with the William George family, we wanted to let other communities know about the partnership. So in 2009, Kathleen George and I presented at the Association of Tribal Archives and Libraries and Museums Conference in Portland um, that was attended by over 500 participants from um, tribal archives, museums, libraries across the U.S. Um, Kathleen talked about the clips uh, that we had digitized, um, about her father's recordings, and I talked about the storage agreement. And a long-term goal that we both have is to see the digitized video uh, eventually put into a teaching resource, uh, particularly for, for TACLA. So as I've noted, much of the work that the archives has collaborated on with Lake Babine and TACLA has been uh, in setting up the storage agreements themselves and then working on the digitization of the records. Um, this work has allowed us to begin dialogue and create a space to talk about the next stages of work and other potential projects that we hadn't originally considered. At the archives, we have been honored to work with these communities to safeguard their holdings and realize the tremendous trust that was put into us, placed into us to do that. With the William George family, we were able to share um, uh, the recordings with indigenous uh, communities at a conference and also to think about other ways to create an educational program. And for Lake Babine, we were able to create a graduate internship and that student has been able to utilize some of that information for his graduate thesis work. As well, some of the recordings that have, been, have informed other work that is happening at Lake Babine, including the archaeological work that uh, Marvin referred to that's been undertaken by the archaeology department. Uh, so lastly, quickly turning to the theme of the session, I'd like to briefly turn to two examples of potential use of digital audio recordings. The first example is found on our online database, and these are audio re uh, recordings that were created by a First Nations a community member. These are not part of the storage agreement. Uh, they're from Elder Mary John, a, a well-respected elder from Saikus who uh, co-authored Stony Creek Woman um, with uh, Bridget Moran, and she was... Um, uh, founder of a lo local chapter of the BC Homemakers Association and was a strong supporter of preservation, of language preservation in the community. Um, so the materials relate to her life work and include analog recordings uh, conducted during the research for the book. Other analog recordings by her were created by the First Nation Studies Department um, when Mary visited UNBC and talked to classes and uh, they were deposited later to the archives by the creator. On those recordings, she talks about her life story, her community uh, work, her passion for her language and heritage. However, while permission was granted to record her stories for classroom use, any future use of the recordings was not outlined in the agreements. Many cases, in many cases, such recordings were done before the existence of the archives at the university. So now that the recordings have been deposited, we are now having to go back to families uh, to obtain permission to digitize them and then determine if, um, if access can in fact be provided in an online environment. So on the database, we've noted their existence and it's noted here that, uh, that it exists, but it's not ac accessible online. So this is an example of the ongoing work that the archives is working through with communities regarding archival deposits that we've inherited. Um, and the other one is from the Northern Heritage Center in Yellowknife that use, uses contemporary video archival, uh, contemporary videos, uh, as well as archival film footage uh, and audio. And this exhibit was uh, created in consultation with community elders and was created with the intent to be an online resource for school curriculum. So these two examples demonstrate the unpacking that is required and to have those dialogues with First Nations communities about ownership and access. Uh, that's a responsibility that is required by archivists and curators uh, when creating digital access of digital content um, owned by 
uh, Indigenous communities. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, I don't know that we have any time for questions. Do we've got five minutes for questions? Okay. Um, so, does anyone have any questions for this fabulous panel? It's just the end of the day, I understand. <laughs> anyone? Well, okay. Um, yeah, yes, thank you very much. And I'm going to move ahead, I guess, pass the mic off to you. Thank you. Thank our panelists. And if you could help me um, pass along these uh, tokens of our appreciation, these gifts, thank you so much. So we are at the end of the uh, sessions. Um, a few other logistical reminders. Um, if I sound like a broken record, <laughs> it is one that to remind you about the fact that there's no ATM at the Muskegon Cultural Center, and so cash is needed. The, there is a um, ATM over uh, the over at the Student Union Building, or slash. It's also called the Nest, um, and the folks at the registration desk can direct you there. So, um, round trip a register uh, round trip. You can tell it's the end of the day. Round trip transportation um, by bus, for those who wish to use them, um, has been arranged and uh, will be loading uh, at the back of the longhouse. So I believe that's actually across the road in that direction. Uh, there's a parking lot there across the road. And the buses will be loading at 5.30 and departing at 5.40 thereabouts. And they will bring people back to the Ponderosa Suites, uh, assuming you're staying there, or if you're not, if that's a drop-off point, um, by 9.30 p.m. And um, we would like you to um, keep your name tags. Don't lose them. I've done this before <laughs> at conferences, showed up the second day without a name tag. It, it happens. Um, we, you know, if you can remember, please do. And is my mic still working? I hope it is. Okay, great. Um, also, please keep the blue binders that you got uh, at the registration desk. Some of the information in there is important for tomorrow, it, particularly this survey form that we uh, that we included in the package. And. Um, Breakfast tomorrow, um, we meet again at 9, but breakfast is served at 8.30 here in the Longhouse. And by all means, um, you know, bring your, bring your water bottles and all that. And last but not least, you've probably seen volunteers um, helping out, running around with t-shirts. You know, you know, Sarah and others have been texting them and they've been gathering themselves, taking photos and, you know, helping set up lunch and, you know, helping with a variety of logistics. And um, we have many, I, there's too long of a list to name them all, but I want to give a round of applause to the volunteers. <laughs> and I, am I forgetting anything, Sarah? Because <laughs> if I am, now is the... Okay, Deborah Sparrow will be at Musqueam, an artisan. So, and, Jer and Jerry's here, I assume you want. Very quickly, you only need money if you want to buy a drink for the artisan. Oh, right, yeah, so he's, <laughs> he's adding a caveat about the cash. You only need it if you want to buy an alcoholic drink or a drink that's served at the cash bar, or if you want to buy from the artisans who, take, who will be taking cash. So that's just, and dinner is paid, yeah, dinner is paid for, by the way, that's, part of your registration. So, so um, again, di uh, breakfast tomorrow at 8.30 here, and then we'll begin at 9 um, with the first or uh, structured session. So thank you so much, and have a great evening.